So it's my um, privilege this morning to um, introduce uh, Dr. Neff, who is going to introduce our distinguished visitors. But today we're really celebrating the uh, tremendous partnership that we've had through the years with our colleagues uh, at the Air Force, uh, particularly through Travis Air Force Base. But uh, this is a now a relatively uh, long-standing relationship that's involved uh, a true partnership, both educationally from a clinical training point of view, participation in the mission of readiness for the military, as well as um, ongoing expansion of training opportunities for our residents here as well. So it's really been uh, uh, quite a successful um, partnership that we've had and we have a variety of uh, distinguished visitors and leadership from the uh, Air Force with us visiting UC Davis and in honor of that visit today Dr. Neff helped put together this uh, special Grand Rounds uh, highlighting some of the um, extraordinary uh, skill and talent that we have the privilege of uh, sharing uh, here at UC Davis. So, Dr. Neff. So thank you so much for being here. I do want to take a moment to recognize, before I get to Dr. Sampson, a couple of the folks we have here today um, from our medical group as well as from Big Air Force, as we call it. Um, Colonel uh, Donnelly is one of the directors of external communications and affairs for our med group, so it helps us interface with places like UC Davis in solidifying some of those collaborations. Colonel Wanacott is the deputy commander of our medical group at Travis, and then Colonel Greg York is a uh, trauma surgeon and he is one of the um, surgical consultants to the, to the major generals at the higher Air Force level. He and I had the opportunity to deploy together at Bagram along with uh, Tim Williams and Dr. Zach Aluzny and Gerlach and so uh, that's where we got to know each other. He is uh, one of the, the, uh, the people that helps solidify some of the long-term training objectives and some of the collaborations that we have and, and is certainly supportive of things like this that are happening here. So. We're very grateful for him uh, to be here with us. Colonel Sampson um, has a 16-year uh, member of the, the Air Force, trained in Texas at Wolford Hall, and then uh, had deployed several times to Iraq and Afghanistan, and then did a vascular surgery fellowship at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, and then has deployed since then. And so he has a unique perspective on how uh, vascular surgery and some of the endovascular therapies for trauma can be implemented um, in a real world situation. So as he talks, there's certainly some uh, very fertile ground for research opportunities. I always like to put a plug in for research. And, and so just be thinking about some of the things that he's, he's discussing and how they potentially could impact practice and for the residents especially how potentially some of the things that he says could, could germinate and, and bloom into some pretty interesting projects. So with that, I'll turn it over to him. Thanks. All right, thank you, Luke, and uh, thank you, Dr. Farmer, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, thank you, sirs, uh, for your attendance, and, uh, and thanks to uh, Dr. Dawson and Dr. Pevick uh, for their continued support uh, of Tim and uh, myself uh, in their uh, division. Um, today, I'd like to talk to you about endovascular interventions for trauma and beyond. Uh, first, uh, I have no um, relevant financial disclosures, but I would like to disclose that I'm not a trauma surgeon. I'm an Air Force surgeon, so that makes me a military surgeon. I'm trained in vascular surgery, um, and I have a particular interest in trauma. I'm also the consultant to the Air Force Surgeon General uh, for matters related to vascular surgery. Today I'd like to talk to you about um, modern management of vascular injury, endovascular intervention in the ICU, resuscitative interventions, obstacles to endovascular intervention, um, talk a little bit about our uh, ongoing collaboration in these areas, uh, and then uh, point to the way forward. To begin, modern management of vascular injury. Um, well, why do we care about vascular injury? Um, vascular injury is important because these injuries are often dramatic. Uh, they lead to hemorrhage and death. Uh, there was a panel discussion at uh, the uh, American Association for Surgery and Trauma meeting in 2011 where the members were uh, queried um, and um, the results of this query uh, led to the conclusion uh, that the membership indicated that tourniquets, shunts, and endovascular techniques are essential or emerging tools for hemorrhage control and the management of vascular injury. So when we talk about endovascular intervention, 
Um, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about uh, vascular access, usually image guided, we're talking about catheter directed imaging, and then endovascular delivery of catheters, balloons, stents, endographs, embolic agents, and possibly filters. At the conclusion of the intervention, then we have access site management, which usually involves some type of closure. Some injury patterns are very well studied. Uh, this is a report from the AAST, it's a multi-center trial, comparing the outcomes of open versus endovascular treatment of traumatic aortic injury, uh, where they demonstrated a, um, a remarkable uh, decrease in the mortality associated with endovascular intervention. A uh, group in Houston has uh, provided further information about the uh, midterm results of this type of therapy uh, where they've shown um, uh, continued uh, success um, after um, uh, several years. They also reported on the evolution of the technology uh, which is uh, related to uh, improved uh, technical success in initial treatment. Other uh, injury patterns that are um, uh, frequently um, treated with endovascular adjuncts uh, include um, uh, blunt solid organ injury. This is a report um, out of Jacksonville uh, where they reported on uh, improved effectiveness of non-operative management of splenic injury um, with angiographic embolization. Pelvic fracture uh, is another injury pattern that's uh, to, quite amenable uh, to uh, endovascular intervention and, and often difficult to manage otherwise. Uh, this report um, uh, from Los Angeles uh, where they uh, demonstrated the uh, safety and effectiveness of angiographic embolization in the management of pelvic hemorrhage associated with um, fracture and with uh, visceral injury. Penetrating injuries can also be managed with endovascular techniques. Uh, this may involve just localization and characterization of an injury before open repair. It also could involve damage control, uh, such as balloon occlusion or stent grafting uh, in preparation of definitive management um, uh, via open techniques. Or it might be uh, just a pure a definitive management um, with an endovascular technique. Uh, here's uh, one representative injury. This is a proximal subclavian injury that involves the uh, origin of the vertebral, an area that's difficult to expose, highlights the uh, benefits of endovascular therapy. Uh, here you have kind of just a depiction of the considerations for uh, open exposure for this lesion um, with the associated morbidity uh, uh, versus uh, endovascular approach, uh, covered stent uh, which handles it, and then you have access site closure to manage. Uh, late complications of penetrating injury also are amenable to endovascular techniques. Uh, demonstrated here uh, is a pseudoaneurysm uh, likely treated with a thrombin injection under ultrasound guidance. Uh, these two pictures show uh, the uh, 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 post-traumatic fistula uh, that was successfully treated with a covered stent. Uh, this review from uh, Pittsburgh uh, showed the evolution of endovascular interventions for trauma over the last decade uh, where they showed that uh, not only uh, penetrating uh, injuries are increasingly treated with endovascular means but uh, especially the blunt uh, and this is really driven by that management of thoracic aortic injury. Uh, they also demonstrated improved mortality um, over that same time frame. Uh, they also uh, interestingly noted uh, that early endovascular intervention was associated with uh, improved mortality and they concluded that outcomes after vascular injury may benefit from this expertise and that these should be incorporated in the early treatment algorithm of trauma patients with vascular injury. Uh, same institution, uh, they also uh, made the uh, converse association of delay to interventional uh, radiology associated with uh, increased mortality. Um, and uh, really highlight their conclusion here uh, that the operating theater uh, may become the most appropriate location where either operative interventions, catheter-based interventions, or both can occur without impediment to improve the outcomes of the patients. So beyond um, vascular uh, injury management, endovascular therapies have a prominent role in the ICU. Excuse me. There we go. Okay. For the management of pulmonary failure, uh, cardiac failure, uh, or uh, prevention and management of venous thromboembolism. 
Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation is a technique used in the ICU for management of pulmonary failure and uh, often uh, these days uh, involves uh, a veno venous circus, uh, circuit. This is a depiction of the Avalon catheter. It's a large catheter. Uh, it's placed through the jugular vein intended to pass through the right atrium um, with um, aspiration of blood for the SVC and the IVC and the return uh, through the um, right to atrial uh, outflow here into the RV. You can see here depicted um, that uh, if this placement um, is misguided, um, you can have ventricular injury. Uh, commonly, this uh, catheter is placed using echocardiogram guidance or bedside ultrasound. Uh, fluoroscopy can also be used, um, and so this is something that can be placed in the ICU uh, with image guidance and appropriate expertise. Um, treatment of cardiac failure, uh, similar kind of concept here. A uh, common uh, modern uh, device is the Abiomed Impella device. Again, large devices here um, that are placed uh, through the uh, um, arterial circulation across the aortic valve to help uh, outflow from the um, uh, left ventricle. Uh, again, placement requires some kind of uh, imaging, can be performed at the bedside safely uh, with appropriate expertise in imaging. The uh, prevention of venous thromboembolism is uh, also uh, a common uh, topic or um, area of interest in the ICU and critically injured patients. Um, uh, IVC filters are commonly used to protect from uh, um, fatal PE. Uh, traditionally, these are placed uh, under fluoroscopy. And here, um, if you can make that out, filter, and there's a, a sheath, either a delivery sheath, uh, uh, most likely. Um, but um, beyond um, uh, this traditional technique of, um, of uh, fluoroscopy guided uh, delivery of the filter, um, intravascular ultrasound uh, or duplex can be used at the bedside uh, for uh, filter placement. Um, the group in Birmingham has a lot of experience with this and they published on the um, uh, technical uh, success uh, of this uh, and they put in almost uh, 400 uh, IVC filters at the bedside uh, on critically ill patients uh, using IVIS. Um, this is a nice depiction here of the, um, the picture that you can get, although it's not always this pretty, um, but uh, with the IVIS you can identify your landmarks uh, and choose placement uh, in the appropriate area. Uh, beyond the uh, prevention of PE, the treatment of uh, venous thrombosis, uh, there's a variety of tools that can be used to assist with that, um, from uh, uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis or pharmacomechanical thrombolysis. There's also some aspiration catheters. Um, walking through that, uh, the uh, ECOS device is very interesting. It's uh, new uh, and uh, it's an ultrasound accelerated um, uh, device that uh, basically it's a catheter, a thrombolytic catheter with multiple side holes uh, for perfusion of TPA. Uh, the uh, ultrasound accelerates the, um, uh, the uh, transmission of the TPA into the thrombus. It is indicated for the treatment of massive and submassive PE um, and it seems to work uh, very well in early experience. This is the uh, Angiovac device, which uh, very different. It's uh, not a thrombolytic catheter, rather it's a very large uh, 26 French, uh, 22 French device with a 26 French sheath. It's used for aspiration thrombectomy, um, most useful for iliocable thrombus. So beyond the uh, management of vascular injury and um, utility in the ICU, Endovascular techniques have a role in uh, resuscitative interventions. And uh, this time I'd uh, just like to ask for a show of hands who's heard of Reboa. Great, that's pretty good. Uh, quite a few folks uh, have not, but it's a hot topic these days. And uh, of course, anybody who went to the AAST meeting recently, this was a, a common topic. Uh, if you uh, follow the emergency medicine uh, um, blogs, uh, or uh, follow their um, uh, websites, then uh, Reboa is also a hot topic there. Um, so um, a lot of folks in, involved with uh, trauma and resuscitation are interested. Um, essentially for, uh, I, I'm gonna, we'll talk quite a bit about it, but uh, to just get started, Reboa is, uh, is essentially uh, placing a balloon like this somewhere in the aorta to occlude the aorta to prevent the blood from leaking out below the balloon preserve circulation through the brain to the brain and to the heart. Pretty simple idea, I think. 
Well, the history of Reboa, it's not a new idea. Um, Dr. Hughes, Colonel Hughes, first described it uh, in the Korean War, uh, and he used this technique in three patients. Uh, these were patients with uh, penetrating abdominal trauma that did not respond to massive uh, uh, resuscitation or massive transfusion. Um, so he was intrigued by the idea. He did uh, have some encouraging physiologic results, although the, uh, the injuries uh, resulted in the, the death of all those patients. Uh, the result of his experience, he suggested that more study was required uh, for this uh, novel technique. Well, there are not a whole lot of study or reports in literature uh, until the uh, mid-80s, uh, and then a group in Brooklyn uh, reported on their experience, and essentially they um, had uh, uh, 21 patients um, that had uh, gunshot wounds or shotgun wounds to their abdomen. Uh, these were the non-responders uh, to initial resuscitation after penetration, uh, penetrating after presentation for their penetrating injury. Right? Um, and uh, so uh, out of nearly 300 patients who required laparotomy, this represented a small percentage of them. They had uh, good hemodynamic effects, um, although the, uh, the constellation of injuries were massive uh, and, uh, and their outcomes were poor. Uh, they concluded that the technique of uh, intra-aortic balloon occlusion uh, was an effective, comparatively easy and versatile method of proximal control. Not a lot happened uh, in the literature um, until more recently, and now we've uh, come to the situation where um, the BBC is reporting on Reboa, and uh, they're reporting that the London Air Ambulance has um, done Reboa uh, at the roadside there in London. Um, so how did we get from Colonel Hughes to uh, the BBC reporting on uh, British medics doing at the roadside. Well, um, a couple of things happened. One is the endovascular um, uh, revolution and uh, the um, uh, use and description uh, by vascular surgeons for uh, balloon occlusion uh, as an adjunct uh, in the treatment of ruptured aortic aneurysms. Uh, the other very important thing that happened is that a group of um, enthusiastic and energetic Air Force vascular surgeons met the challenge of vascular injury in Iraq and Afghanistan, and as they cycled through and came back, uh, they had um, a research facility that supported them, uh, as well as residents and, um, and enthusiastic investigators. And so they uh, revisited uh, issues uh, such as Reboa, and they started studying it. Some of the results of that work, um, and I'd like to point out this is a collaboration between um, British um, uh, Royal Army uh, medics um, and um, uh, folks uh, uh, in the National Capital area associated with our military and then uh, Rasmussen's group there in San Antonio. So a military collaboration, uh, and they studied Reboa and animal models. Uh, this is where they described uh, balloon occlusion um, compared to resuscitative thoracotomy. Further, they went to define the physiologic tolerance of Reboa uh, with the survival model and Reboa up to 90 minutes. And then more recently, uh, they've uh, investigated the uh, technology uh, and uh, made uh, some inroads into improving uh, the technology that we have uh, to make it more accessible and more relevant to trauma care. So now I'd like to walk you through um, some algorithms for use of Reboa. This is an algorithm from the University of Maryland Shock Trauma. Um, there's a, another algorithm here from the uh, Joint Theater Trauma System, essentially the um, kind of collaboration of uh, senior military medics that come up with this. And so um, we'll just walk through this a little bit. Two pages. So this is the um, patient who prevent, presents uh, in, um, in shock with a pulse. Um, if, uh, if they have a pulse, then you go to page two. If they don't, uh, then uh, you, uh, you consider the mechanism of their injury. Um, so uh, blunt injured patients uh, without a pulse, what do we do? Check for a rhythm. We look with the fast. Is there any cardiac activity? No. Well, we declare them dead. If they've got activity, then um, what do we do? A thoracotomy or consider zone one Reboa. For penetrating injuries, those folks who've been down greater than 15 minutes, declare them dead. If they've had CPR less than 15 minutes, um, then uh, we consider where the location of the injury is. If it's a neck injury, uh, then we don't want to occlude the aorta downstream of that injury, exacerbate the bleeding, right? Take them to the operating room, deal with the injury. Chest injury, then uh, we consider thoracotomy, right? You're going to get aortic control, you're going to expose the injury, you'll deal with the injury directly. Abdominal, pelvic, Extremity injuries, 
uh, pulseless patient, well, you have thoracotomy with aortic clamping or Reboa zone one options. So how about those patients that do have a pulse? Well, those patients have a pulse who's, who have uh, hemorrhagic shock or hypotension, they have transient or no response to resuscitation, or they have pre-hospital CPR, return to sign of life. Um, well, we, again, we consider the mechanism of injury and, uh, and then uh, the potential area of injury. So if we suspect a cardiac or aortic injury, well, we don't want to use Reboa in that situation. If you, have, um, you don't suspect that, but you have a positive FAST, well, Reboa 1 might be useful adjunct. Fast is negative, you got a pelvic fracture, okay, again, consider Reboa, but Reboa 1, not necessarily, Reboa 3, zone 3, down towards the pelvis. For penetrating injuries, again, neck injuries, chest injuries, Reboa is not useful, um, probably exacerbate the uh, injury, abdomen, pelvis, extremities, consider Reboa zone 1. To review the, the zones here, again, uh, zone 1, the thoracic aorta, uh, zone 3, the infrarenal aorta, Zone two is a visceral segment. There's concerns about inflating the balloon here, and, and really for that algorithm, it, it fits in very nicely for zone one versus zone three. All right, so we've got the translational research. We have uh, some algorithms. What's the clinical experience been? Well, the clinical experience looks kind of like this. Right? Busted up patient, Reboa cart, Put the Reboa in, confirm the placement. Maybe you go to diagnostic imaging, secure the Reboa, treat the injury. Okay, so the clinical experience has been limited, uh, but uh, primarily reported on from the group at Shock Trauma. And this is uh, an initial report from this year um, where they reported on uh, use of Reboa in six patients. I think the things that I'd like to emphasize here is that you have uh, blood pressure before Reboa, blood pressure after. As expected, you have a significant uh, physiologic response. Also worth noting, well, is this technique easy to do? Uh, they placed Reboa within four to six minutes. They had good outcomes, uh, four out of six survivors. I think based on the injury severity score and the description of the injuries, um, this is uh, successful. Their conclusions from their early clinical experience is that Reboa is feasible and effective means of proactive aortic control for patients in end-stage shock from blunt and penetrating mechanisms that it can be performed by acute care surgeons who have benefited from brief instruction on a limited endovascular skill set. Future work should be aimed at the development of devices as well as studies to find the, as well as studies to define the populations in which this adjunct is beneficial. So knowing all this, what are our uh, obstacles to endovascular intervention, whether it's injury management in the ICU, uh, or uh, in the resuscitation bay. Number of obstacles, really. The operating environment, there's a skills gap, we have clinical inexperience, technology is an issue, and maybe expense. Environment, well, we've got a critically injured patient. We've got lots of places that we can potentially take care of them with lots of different options. I think this is a common scenario. You have a patient critically injured, they're in the resuscitation bay. Do they go for diagnostic imaging? Do they go for imaging and an imaging guided intervention? Do they go to the operating room? How can we bring all those things together? We also have a training deficiency. If we're trying to get the patient to the right location, we'll have to also have the right people with the skills there to take care of them. Um, this is a, a germane issue today based on our training paradigms because our general surgery training has diminished exposure and experience with vascular surgery. Our vascular surgery training model uh, reduces some of the um, general surgery and trauma surgery exposure as well. And our trauma surgery training, I, as far as I'm aware, there's no established endovascular skills training for trauma surgeons. Dr. Rasmussen, uh, Woods, Woodson, Rich, and Maddox came together and they uh, published this uh, opinion article a few years ago about vascular trauma, its management, and uh, uh, crossroads uh, that we're at, so to speak. Uh, they made the following uh, uh, recommendations or challenges. Uh, they say that we needed to assure that vascular and acute care surgery training included the management of vascular injury. Uh, they recommended basic endovascular skills for trauma and acute care surgeons, and they recommended the level one trauma experience for all military surgeons, not military trauma surgeons or vascular surgeons, but all military surgeons. 
Other limitations include the technology. Our imaging technology continues to advance and improves, but it's more difficult to kind of understand and control as the options expand. Uh, it's also expensive. Uh, the trauma-specific devices are limited. We now have trauma-specific devices for uh, aortic injury. Uh, however, the, the Reboa, the balloon uh, that I showed you earlier, well, that's adopted for aneurysm care. So most of our tools are, um, are borrowed uh, from other uh, vascular diseases. So summarizing these obstacles, the thought leaders, a large group, and primarily prominent trauma surgeons, uh, came together and they expressed this uh, opinion piece on catheter-based hemorrhage control and trauma surgeons. They had a number of recommendations, but really the highlights are right here. They recommended that we teach ultrasound guided arterial access to all acute care physicians, that we use Reboa in the emergency department, that we bring hemorrhage con control capability to our patients, that we bring our patients with hemorrhage to a hybrid OR, that we combine our minimally and maximally invasive capabilities in one place, and that we develop some robust methodologies to track our outcomes. So how are we doing in this? Uh, what's our strategic response? Well, we need infrastructure investment. We need to have the imaging tools capable, available to us to use them. Uh, and we need to know how to use them. Uh, we need uh, translational research to support and further our understanding of these techniques. We need resident education, focused skill training for established surgeons, and of course clinical study. Some of these things we're doing very well already. Uh, <clears throat> Reboa is under study at our clinical investigation facility out of Trappist Air Force Base. Um, we're uh, led by um, uh, Luke Neff and uh, Tim Williams. They're studying the physiologic impact of Reboa. We're building on that experience in San Antonio to answer, further answer some questions that remain. Um, we're collaborating with the biomedical engineers from UC Davis uh, to further uh, develop the technology and also develop a robot model and simulator that will help advance our uh, physiologic studies. Uh, these efforts are supported by Dr. Russo and Dr. Keller, a couple of the residents from the surgery program. Our collaboration also includes training. And within our GME programs that are established, we continue to emphasize vascular surgery training for our general surgery residents. We're incorporating basic endovascular skills training for those same residents. For our vascular surgery residents, we want to continue to em emphasize trauma surgery training, and we want to incorporate the critical care interventional training uh, for our residents. At DGMC, we're also um, a site uh, for advanced surgical training. Uh, we will host uh, an asset or advanced surgical skills for exposure and trauma course uh, next month, and we are developing an endovascular skills for trauma resuscitative surgery course uh, at, um, at Dave Grant as well. This E-STARS course developed again in San Antonio, um, and uh, the uh, audience is a trauma surgeon. It's a two-day course, didactic endo simulator and live animal model um, with the following objectives. Essentially, the objectives are to teach the basic endovascular skill sets to trauma surgeons so that they can uh, safely access the arterial tree uh, and um, proceed to Reboa diagnostic imaging or even more advanced uh, treatment modalities uh, as their uh, skills enable them. Our clinical collaboration um, is currently under discussion, and um, uh, this includes a trauma conference, a vascular trauma conference, the development of a Reboa algorithm uh, and kit, and, uh, and development of vascular and trauma surgery partnerships. So the way forward, our keys to success, I think we need to identify and recognize our vascular trauma champions. We need to provide endovascular training for our trauma surgeons. We need to expand our clinical collaboration and we need to continue to support our research and training in these novel techniques. So in summary, endovascular interventions have an established and expanding role in the management of injured and critically ill. Gaps in skill, experience, technology limit the implementation and further development of these interventions. Our clinical collaboration, focused skills training, translational research, technological development, will all catalyze improved understanding, patient care, and outcomes. And in conclusion, I think we all here, our established collaboration and our potential for the future allows us to meet these challenges in development, study, 
adoption and dissemination of these skills, techniques, and technology. Thanks for your attention. Sir. Well, I just want to uh, thank you for that excellent presentation, and I think we have time to take some questions. I certainly know that the partnership between the VA, David Grant, and UC Davis is one of the sort of models for bridging all of our institutions and bringing all this expertise together, and I really want to just congratulate the vascular uh, division for leading the way in this, and uh, I think as we expand this into trauma, it's really exciting, and this was a perfect representation, and I'm also thinking as an administrator, getting more use of that out of, of OR45, you know, our hybrid OR that is this huge investment that is relatively uh, underutilized. So, questions? As you certainly know from your aortic experience, uh, every once in a while you end up with uh, uh, an artery with the amphibious problem and uh, uh, paralysis. Uh, has that uh, been reported with uh, balloon infusion of the aorta? Uh, and if not, why not? Good, uh, excellent question. And so that was a consideration that was um, um, written about in those early reports. Um, and, um, and through the early and uh, more modern reports, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, instance of spinal cord injury um, that's been associated with, the, um, uh, with Reboa. Um, I think that um, the uh, consideration is, is that um, even with thoracic aortic occlusion, uh, that you uh, augment uh, the perfusion and you have those collateral pathways um, uh, from uh, the upper chest. Um, uh, and it's a temporary occlusion. It's a temporary occlusion as well, and I think an, another way to look at it um, uh, frames it um, kind of like our, our consideration of tourniquets, is that if you, you have a, a patient in profound shock, um, or if you're able to uh, restore a normal um, hemodynamics, at least to part of their body, um, that, uh, that that's probably better for them. Uh, than that uh, continued uh, profound shock. It's an interesting question. It's hard to believe that it, it might not just be a numbers game that we haven't seen it yet. But right. how about in our animal models? Have we seen? Um, no, and in, uh, in, including in the um, uh, the um, ninety minute Reboa as well. So they did have a couple of animals that didn't survive ninety minutes Reboa. Uh, and their resuscitation <coughs> after balloon deflation uh, is, um, was complicated, um, but, um, uh, but they didn't have specific uh, spinal cord ischemia you know, that they could detect. Mm -hmm. But uh, an area, I think, of continued concern um, and, uh, and something that uh, fits well with some uh, of our animal model testing um, and uh, an area that, that we may consider. Very nice. Uh, two questions. One, uh, Right, that's a good question. The ESTART is not the only uh, course. The uh, Maryland group uh, has a, uh, a more limited several hour course called the BEST or Basic Intervascular Skills for Trauma. Um, and the uh, ESTART's course is a two day course. Uh, they, um, they did their initial validation study of the ESTART's course and uh, that was published. Um, and they um, had a follow on portion of that. So we're uh, awaiting a publication of those results. As it stands, there's not a specific plan for follow-on training. What the experience has been is that um, at shock trauma and at Houston is that you have the training for um, trauma surgeons, uh, and then as their clinical activity um, evolves and they do use it on a day-to-day -day basis, that a local champion is identified for that kind of upkeep training. Um, it, the uh, other opportunities for that, obviously, our collaboration with the uh, local interventionalists, whether it's vascular surgeons or beyond. And I think that's an important piece that should be considered and something that's you know, readily available to us is uh, basic training for the trauma surgeons, but then endo simulator time, cat lab time, um, you know, especially if we're talking about um, ultrasound guided access, you know, safe access, cheap wires, that's something that can easily be um, practiced um, in an elective vascular case under the supervision of the vascular surgeon or other interventionalists. Dr. Dawson. 
I think one important concept is that these skills <coughs> should be seen as isolated for a particular application. So that if you do percutaneous vascular access or one indication, it's very much that, that skill set translates very nicely to another application. And we think of, you know, the discussion today is Rebola for patients who have trauma and hemorrhagic shock, but we use it for non traumatic hemorrhagic shock models in the human. So for some of the ruptured aortic aneurysm, the current practice now is to first place an aortic balloon inclusion catheter, then induce the anesthetic, and then if they're a candidate for endovascular repair, do the endovascular repair. If they're not, then they get the open repair, but they've already got proximal balloon. There's a case two weeks ago at the VA where a patient in the vacuum had hemorrhagic shock and retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Old guy, 75, blood pressure less than his age. He went to the operating room. The first step was to place a catheter to Rebola and then have induction of anesthesia. His blood pressure came up. He had induction of anesthesia. He was resuscitated. He had a retroperitoneal iliac artery hole fixed, and it was a better outcome than it might have been obtained otherwise. But it was a translation of the same skill set. So for a trauma surgeon to put in IVC filter or a tunnel catheter or some other catheter guide wire technique, the skills translate. So I think skills maintenance is part of it. It's just by doing more image-guided procedures and more catheter guide wire manipulations. Exactly, and I think that's part of my idea with putting all that together is that it's not just Rebola and then call interventional radiology for everything else. It really is all of these things are available if you have that basic skill set and that desire and imagination to be involved with that. I also didn't include in there, but increasing reports about Rebola used for gastrointestinal hemorrhage, postpartum hemorrhage, so applications well beyond trauma in that kind of the familiar post-surgical patient or surgical patient who has hemorrhagic shock that's difficult to control. I can certainly see an easy role, a logical role. Postpartum hemorrhage makes a ton of sense. And that's actually been reported for some time. Some of the early reports outside of vascular surgery or trauma were related to that. Surgical oncology is another area, and Dr. Dawson alluded to it with our approach to aneurysms. There are lots of situations where you might consider. Certainly if the profile of these devices come down, placement of an aortic balloon to preposition it prior to whatever your operative exposure is so that you can control the aorta endovascularly if the need arises. And I think that that's how some of the trauma surgeons, the ones that I've met from shock trauma who are using this, goes back to their algorithm. They have a patient in shock. They put an A-line, femoral A-line with the sheet. It's a small sheet. So they have their access there while they have a pulse and a blood pressure, and they haven't made a decision or a commitment to Reboa. They simply have a sheet in the arterial circulation, and they can use a wire catheter, upsize the sheet, place the balloon quite quickly if they need to. So that's really how I see it fitting into our algorithm. It's just a real slight extension from the femoral puncture for an arterial blood gas that just gets followed with a short wire and a sheet. Ma'am? Do you see the shock trauma as being
mobile imaging is, is quite good. The, um, the current Reboa technique really is a image guided one, but it can be placed without uh, imaging and just image confirmation uh, prior to inflation. Uh, the new balloon catheters are being developed really, um, that's um, uh, the intent is for them to be lower profile uh, and self guiding so they can be placed uh, without image guide. Um, and, and that makes it even easier uh, for that uh, case that uh, gets out of control. Um, interestingly enough, too, that uh, group from Brooklyn, when they described their Reboa experience, four of those patients, they placed Reboa through the external iliac artery after laparotomy. So they opened the patient up and noticed holes everywhere that were hosing on them, and their recourse was to go through the external iliac, put the balloon in, and inflate it. Um, which they felt was, uh, you know, just as good an alternative as uh, proximal extension or superciliac aortic exposure with clamping. Um, and, and I think that that um, makes sense to me if that's what you're prepared to do and that's what your mindset is. So um, it, it fits in that situation as well. One of the uh, downfalls for cross-country aortic is getting uh, clamping off of the Absolutely. I, a couple of things that they did show us is that in that 90-minute uh, physiologic tolerance study, uh, they did have uh, limited survival and they did histologic analysis of the aorta. So they were able to confirm that there was no aortic injury from this 90 minutes in the bullet. Um, they, um, I mean, the uh, long-term, uh, actually before I get to the long-term sequelae, I think that the clamping issue um, is also an interesting one. With the clamp, you, you kind of have an on-off, although we do partially unclamp and slow unclamp and things like that. With the balloon occlusion, you do have some more flexibility in that regard. Um, you can dial down the balloon and have partial occlusion. Uh, that's a question that's very interesting uh, to our group, uh, and I'll, I'll leave uh, that to Luke or Tim to comment on, but that's an area of active investigation. Uh, the uh, long-term uh, ischemic effects of Rebel, I think, again, is another thing that's not well characterized yet. Uh, and, uh, and would be an area that uh, suits our research efforts. So I think, yeah, that's a great point, and one that we, we look at these papers from the Institute of Surgical Research down in Texas that is an incredible facility. It's all one shop in one place, and we're a little bit jealous because they can do those things in terms of survival after 48 hours, no longer that we can't, we don't have the ability to do right now. But the other thing I want to highlight is um, the this area, this, this whole place, and this collaboration is so ripe for, for advanced collaboration. And I want to point out that uh, Jaren Lee and, and Oren Gottlieb are two biomedical engineering students that have been working on this project with Ben and, and some of these other folks, looking at just simulators, but not only simulators, but also testing chambers as we develop new techniques. And, and because this has already been something that people recognize as an interesting uh, area for, for you know, growth, and, and people are actually using it in humans, there's a lot of backfill that has to happen. So now we're defining the right patients clinically, but also a lot of the basic science. And what happens when you, you know, when, when you start to resuscitate with an occluded aorta, and that aortic diameter starts to change? And how do you, I mean, there's just all kinds of things that, that in areas for research that we have, uh, that we have the opportunity to, to move into. And so it's, it's really interesting. And, and again, I'm always plugging the research piece, so I want people to come and, and get involved. And I think if you ask Ben or Rachel, it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. So we have lots of questions to answer from a basic science or translational science standpoint. And uh, we just need the time and the manpower. But um, anyway, and try we, to answer questions. As you can see, we've got the enthusiasm here and then uh, and the interest. But the interest exists beyond this. Uh, you know, reference back to the AAST meeting that um, some of us attended. The, you know, there's a lot of interest there, and so um, so uh, this is uh, stuff that um, fits well on meetings. Uh, well, I also heard you say the emergency room docs. Absolutely. So I'm yeah. imagining you know, and then who gets re who's responsible for it if an ER doc puts it in. You know, how do you manage yeah. that transition as well? Right. If you look or at the, the, the EM, you know, guys, what they're interested in, you know, ECMO in the ER, 
um, Reboa in the ER. So right, they're they're all over this stuff, and uh, and I think it'd be nice if we can stay a little bit ahead of them because um, they'll need our help. And um, uh, but uh, but if we don't want to be ahead of them, if if we just want to kind of watch and see how it evolves, well, I, I think we're going to see that um, they're going to put one in, um, and uh, and they'll be calling us about it. Question. Oh, I just had a, uh, a thought. Uh, you know, in the uh, uh, total vascular isolation technique for uh, liver resection, uh, you sort of see the ischemic events coming. You can pre-treat the patient with uh, free radical scavengers, things that inhibit superoxide dismutase, uh, and it seems to uh, mitigate the reperfusion injury. Uh, is there any work on uh, developing some sort of fast-acting uh, uh, similar uh, agent that will uh, uh, mitigate the effects of reperfusion uh, injury? Because uh, with Reboa, that, of, of course, is uh, right. uh, uh, something you got to worry about. None that I'm aware of, but I, again, that's a great question. You can imagine a situation where you uh, inflate the balloon and, and 30 minutes later, you've got the injury treated and you're ready to reperfuse half their body. It'd be nice to have a cocktail that could uh, help keep them out of trouble. Um, you know, I, the, um, again, extremity injuries with tourniquets, we've seen things like that. And um, a you know, common mitigation strategy there is just to uh, offload some of that um, uh, ischemic blood uh, out of a, a venous catheter or venous injury uh, that's often present. Um, but as far as a specific uh, pharmaco, uh, pharmacological intervention, I'm not aware of any study, but I, I bet there's one coming. So I certainly know that that's an area of interest of our transplant colleagues as well, as we do more of these uh, extended criteria kidney transplants and other transplants, the uh, whole uh, area of investigation about trying to restore or sort of resuscitate, if you will, these organs. Uh, there's a lot of overlap there. So. Yeah, sure it is. Luke, could you get on that? Add it to the list. I hope everybody else is in terms of the residents, because there's some good stuff here. There's a lot of room to run. All right. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it.